discretion is advised. Hey everyone, this video is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering you a free audiobook with a 30-day free trial membership. All you need to do is go to audibletrial.com forward slash bgunlocked. The link is in the description below, and now enjoy the video. Hey everyone, welcome back to Board Games Unlocked, and we are going to be continuing the Board Game Geek's Top 100 Games of All Time. This time it's going to be 50 through number 1, and kind of my thoughts on, on the games, each of the games in that list, and kind of my thoughts on the Board Game Geek Top 100 as we go along. Um, and you might get to see me, you know, re-rate or rate some games, and I mean, it's just kind of, it's a fun romp through the Top 100, so... If you haven't seen the the first part where I went through top uh, number 100 through 51, definitely go check that out. But uh, here's here's number 50. So we were gonna continue uh, from where we left off. So number 50 is there. It is Race for the Galaxy. So <clears throat> I've never played Race for the Galaxy, but uh, I have played Roll for the Galaxy, which we went over in the past. Where was Roll for the Galaxy? It was number. Uh, number 71, so Race for the Galaxy has def has 21 spots above it, and I think a lot of people do prefer Race over Roll. Most people like card games over dice games, so I can definitely see that. The race has a plethora of expansions as well. Roll is slowly getting them, albeit they're extremely expensive. But I've never seen a reason to go and go out and get Race for the Galaxy because I have Roll, so this is kind of what kept me from playing it. Um, and I would say Race and Roll are two drastically different games, so I would say they could both warrant being in the top 100. Whether or not they're good enough, I'm not sure. I think Roll is, but, I mean, clearly most people think Race is. So, 49, Seven Wonders. Okay, this game definitely needs to be in the top 100. Not only does it, did it kind of, I don't, I don't know if revolutionize is the right word, but they kind of like, Definitely set the tone for for card drafting, and I love card drafting, so Seven Wonders is kind of like a must-have game. And it's it's one of those that just works at any number of players. Like, you can play up from two up to seven. I, I would say that the two-player game is not bad. I mean, each player controls kind of a dummy character. I don't think that's terrible. Um, I would argue that that way is better than Seven Wonders Duel. But it's one of those games that, hell, even going up to seven, the, the game takes the same amount of time, which is amazing. And it's a civilization game where you don't, I mean, you don't screw over, over other people. You're trying to build your wonders, you know, draft cards, get points. It's, it's so much fun. The expansions are really good. They do make it a little bit more complicated, but if you're playing Seven Wonders a lot, then you can get the Cities expansion, the Leaders expansion, Babel if you really want some randomness, and then the uh, Armada, I think was the latest one, which adds uh, a seaboard, which I think is really cool too. I thought that that's added some freshness. So Seven Wonders for sure gets added, um, or it deserves to be in the top 100. Nemesis, ooh, I did not know this game made it to the top 100. Nemesis is a game by Awakened Realms, which is kind of one of those, like, they came out with this War of Mine, and then they did Lords of Hellas, and then now they've just become a name where it's like, if it has Awakened Realms' name on it, it's gonna, it's gonna sell. It's gonna, it's like, it's most likely gonna be fantastic. So, I don't know, like, what formula they're using, but... God, keep doing it because I love their games. Nemesis is no exception. I actually need to raise this to a nine because of its expansion. So I I I got the Kickstarter. So like I have the Carnivores expansion and I have the Void Seekers expansion, and it also added kind of a campaign. But what's really cool is one of the expansions is a mini game after the main game. Uh, where you are a, another crew going on to the, uh, I think it was called the Nemesis, um, was the, you're going on to the ship after the events of what happened. So this game is a semi-cooperative game that does it right. I have done a, a run-through for Nemesis, so definitely go check that out. Uh, but it's it, it's basically Aliens, the board game, and it's so good. Like, I, I mean, does it need to be on the top 100? See, this is where I'm conflicted, because, once again, this game came out a year ago. And while I think it's one of the best games that has come come out, it's like, 
but how do you compare it to other games that came like they came way before it and they're still doing things right i don't know maybe i mean maybe maybe it is warranted because there's never been a game that came out that was like this so it's it's so good though so yeah sure sure anachrony man there's another nine like anachrony is a mind clash game about time travel uh, that i've done a run through for and i've actually done a recording for the solo playthrough which is phenomenal as well um this is a really, really good work replacement game. I very much like this. Like you, it, I mean, you have your tableau building, so you can get an engine going with the pl things that you, the tiles that you place in your own tableau, and then you also have your workers that you're, that you're, you know, recruiting to go out into the world to get your resources and and do actions out in the world. And uh, the time travel mechanic, I think, is really neat. You can borrow resources from your past, so it's like, oh crap, I really need water now. And you can do it, but then you can create paradoxes. They've done a really, really good job at that theme and making it to where as realistic as you can, I guess, with time travel. But it's it's a really good one. I think it's Mind Clash's best game. Um, and I'm excited for their Fractures in Time expansion. Android Netrunner. So uh, I have a friend that was huge into Netrunner, went to tournaments and all that, and, and whenever they Fantasy Flight, you know, basically quit making it, uh, they, I mean, it just basically died, but I saw the appeal of Netrunner, and I think it would have been really cool, but I never got into it. I did play a game, and it was, it was okay, but, I mean, I can't sit here and rate it. I played one game, and, uh, I mean, it was a while back, so I don't even know, but, I mean, it, it is definitely, like, a really cool concept as one person was a runner trying to breach the corporation, the other person was playing the corporation, so um, I thought it was really cool. Clans of Caledonia, never played, have no idea. I feel like I've heard a lot about it, so, so I think that it could be really good, but I have no idea what it's about. Number 44 is Robinson Crusoe. Now this is a solid game, and a game that's been in my collection almost since the beginning of my my hobby career. Um, a game, I, one of the very few, first games I did a run through for on the channel, uh, and it's a game I want to redo a run through for just because my format has changed. And I mean, I think this is a a solid, solid cooperative game that I love the scenarios for it. Love the one of the favorite mechanics about it is the fact that whenever you have an adventure in one of the three decks, you have a top. A, basically, it's like, hey, you find a cave with a bunch of food in it. Do you want to take it? Oh yeah, hell yeah! It's like, okay, we'll take. And there's a bottom effect that I cover the bottom because that's the repercussions. And so it's like, yeah, okay, yeah, we'll take ten food. Oh yeah, and then you put you shuffle into the event deck and then that could that could come back and let's say you draw that card it's like yeah a bear smells the food now you have to fight a bear off and it's like oh crap we were not planning for this so it's it's a lot of fun the scenarios are all unique and different that makes it a blast to to go through uh their their uh second edition uh re like streamlined the rule book made that a lot better it kind of upgraded the components put in some community event scenarios and their expansion mystery tales adds the campaign and some other ones that I think is really cool. So uh, I really hope, I mean, they did a Voyage of the Beagle, which I thought was a really good expansion where you're like traveling with Charles Darwin and going through a mini campaign with him. But with the second edition, you I don't think you can play with that. So I don't know what their plans are um, in that regard. But I think Robinson Crusoe is definitely uh, worthy of being on the top 100. Voyages of Marco Polo. This is another dice work replacement game that I think is just so good. Like, clearly you can see I've rated it an 8. And this was one of those games that everyone got a special player power that was absolutely broken. Like, in such a way that everyone's powers were broken that the game was balanced. And that's so much fun. Like, not enough people do that where it's like, you can do that? What the fuck? Like, I want, I want that power. And they're like, well, I want yours. Like, it's just insane. Um, and the, the dice work replacement spots are are super solid. Um, the way that you're you're gathering points for this. Now, the, the theme sounds boring as hell. But the gameplay is, is very streamlined. And the player powers kind of make this game. So what, what sucks about it, though, is that this game 
has expansions that are almost that, that are impossible to find. So now I'm I'm interested because they've done a second Voyages of Marco Polo, and I'm not sure if it's released to the United States yet, but I'm curious to see if that's any better than this one, if not better. And if it is better, then like I mean, I don't think it's I don't think both should be on the list, but uh, as of right now, uh, I would I would agree. I would agree. Now, is this should this be higher than a lot of these other ones? I don't think so, but that's 43, the 43rd best game of all time. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's the thing is you have so many people like cuz oh well, 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 we'll get to that in a sec, but so Voyage of Marco Polo. La Havre. Never played. I have never played La Havre. I know I was I've been told multiple times that I should. And is this uh is this Uwe Rosenberg? It is, it is. So I, I most likely will be we will be coming coming to it. Like I'm trying to, you know, check out all of his games. Um like I've checked out Indian Summer. That one's a lot of not Indian Summer. Yeah, it was Indian Summer. Uh, that one is a lot of fun. I have a Feast for Odin and its expansion that I just need to get to the table, but I haven't. So I'll get around to it. But I, as of right now, I haven't played Lahav. Azul. Okay, so I have played Azul. I've played Azul quite a bit. I would say Azul is a 6 out of 10. And here's why. So before anyone like freaks out and shits their pants, uh, five is average, so I think Azul is a little bit above average. I found Azul to be kind of simple in terms of kind of its gameplay. Very pretty game, like it was. I mean, very very nice, you know, simple puzzle game. Um, like the 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 tile drafting and kind of the how you can force your opponents to take certain tiles. And I like the pattern of trying to okay, I need this many blue in this row to slide them over, and then. I, I did like that. The gameplay was fine. I just found it to be a little bit more simple for my taste. Um, and I mean, it's it's not like if someone was like, "Hey, do you want to play Azul?" I'm, I'm I'll probably I'll most likely say yes. Like I'm not gonna be like, "Ooh, Azul." <laughs> well, you're a shit player. No, it's like it, Azul was fine. Now I definitely don't think it needs to be 41. Like God, I remember when this game came out, and it was in 2017. It feels forever ago. But like everyone and their mom was like, was like loving on Azul, and it's like guys, like calm, like, like calm down. Like it's not the best game ever, and they've since released two expansions: the Stained Glass of Sintra or something like that, and then some summer summer one. Um, I haven't played either of those, so I don't know. I've heard they're I've heard they're both better than the base game. And I would hope so. I haven't played the stained glass one because I have Sagrada. So I was like, why do I need another stained glass game? So I don't know. I don't know. But I mean, Azul, man, I really don't think this needs to be on 41. That seems, I mean, it's probably, these are probably the number of ratings. So that's most likely why it's so high. You have 36,000 people who have voted on it. And I mean, it's a, it's a good family game, I guess. So that's probably why. But I don't know. Hey, that's the that's the first the first iteration in this. So I have played one, two, three, four, five, six, six out of that segment. Hey, going up, going up from the last one. Why is my pen not working? There we go. Okay, moving on to forty. I have never played Eclipse. It was one of those things that I think at the time a lot. It was like Eclipse or Twilight Imperium, and. Twilight Imperium is more up my alley anyway, and Eclipse was definitely more Euro at the time. I'm sure I would like Eclipse, but I mean, as far as I know, they, they're they not doing another one. They're not doing expansions, so I have no reason to go out of my way to buy one. So, so yeah, I mean, haven't played it. 39. Hoo, 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 hoo. That is interesting. Um, so, Root. Root. Man. Root is a phenomenal game, phenomenal asymmetric game. It's essentially a war game, and every every player plays a, a woodland faction that comp plays radically different from everyone else. Like, not in such a way of like a player power, because that's not, I wouldn't really call that asymmetry, but literally how every person plays the game is completely different. Um, but their, their goal's the same, so it's like you, everyone's trying to get 30 points. So unlike Cosmic Encounter, for example, well, no, that's kind of the same too. 
Um, but no, it's like not everyone has a goal that they need to meet to win. Um, like in Vast, for example, Vast, okay, the warrior is trying to kill the dragon, dragon's trying to escape, none of that. Everyone's trying to get 30 points, but they do that in a completely different way. I think Root is drastically better than Vast. It is such a good game. I love every faction, like, in it. Like, it's, it, every one of them is, is so much fun to play. Um, funny enough, at the time of this recording, I just got done trying the solo variant. And, uh... I mean, the solo variant's trash, but like the the rest of the game is just so so good that it's. I mean, doesn't need to be thirty nine though. That just seems really high for for a game like this. But I guess it is kind of a one of a kind game, and it's super balanced and stream and streamlined in gameplay. Yeah, yeah, I would argue it's, it at least deserves to be on the list, like for sure. So Root's really good. Tolkien, the Mayan calendar. This is a game I need to play, but I have never. It's it's sold out uh, from a lot of places I see, and I know I would like it without a doubt. Like I think this was the same company that did uh, Teotihuacan, um, or maybe it's the same designers or something. I feel like this and Teotihuacan had like some some tie in together. Now Teotihuacan is way way, you know, higher on this list, like, I think it was around, like, 80s or something, 70s or 80s, um, so I, I don't know, I don't know how, like, Sulkin compares to that, but it came out in 2012, and it's sitting at 38, so it must be really good, and CGE makes solid games anyway, so, 37, now this is interesting, Star Wars Imperial Assault, this was kind of around the time where, I don't remember there being a lot of campaign games, and this one was kind of this, it followed the Descent mechanic, which as I've talked about in the earlier one, I don't care for Descent in any way, but I really like Imperial Assault. I felt it was more balanced, like the just the turn order in general, where it's like, okay, well, one hero goes, then the, then, you know, the Imperial player goes, you know, Alliance, Imperial. And then now you have uh, the app, which is probably driving this game even higher because now the app makes it fully cooperative, which is even better. And the app, you know, controls a lot of it because Fantasy Flight has figured out app capability in their board games that make them just that much better. And this was also a game that had a you know a plethora of expansions, so I mean you'll almost never run out of content. And this is a game that I definitely want to do a series for. I uh, just need to you know have the time to do that. And it has a skirmish. You know, gameplay that I'm not, I don't care for skirmish games, but apparently it's really good. So I think it just it hit it hit on all cylinders. You know, it had the the really good campaign, had the really good skirmish, has the really good app. So I mean, it it makes sense, and it's Star Wars. So I mean, people you know pee pee over Star Wars. So I mean, it's it kind of it has everything going for it. Thirty six through the ages, the story of civilization. Um, I've never played this version, so I, I don't know how it compares to Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization. So, um, but if I'm not mistaken, I actually, I will talk about the, A New Story in a little bit. Mechs versus Minions is one, <laughs> I mean, this game is, this game is an awesome cooperative programming campaign game, like, this was uh, released by Riot Games, which made League of Legends, so it's in that world. You play as, what was it, Yordles, I think is what they were? Characters that were in League of Legends. Um, and it, I mean, clearly it took off, because Riot Games was just like, hey, we're going to try board games, and it was like $70, and it was like one of the best produced games ever made. The, like, ever, the insert was phenomenal, the cards were amazing, the miniatures were awesome, like... Every, everything came in vacuum sealed cases, uh, and they sold it. You, you know they took a, a loss on that because no other company would ever, ever sell a game like that. Like uh, Simon, if they released Max vs. Minions, it would have been like two hundred dollars. Like they sold it for seventy because they had the money essentially to burn. Like they've made so much money off of League of Legends that they're just like, hey, we'll give this a shot. 
and people were begging for more from them and it just never they were like yeah we're not going to do that but i have heard that they have created their own board gaming like division so i'm i'm expecting to see more games from them most likely at the appropriate price but who knows like they people might have bought so much of this that they might have made a profit on it like most of the time you wouldn't see that but it's so good the programming is awesome the 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 scenarios in the game were so much fun this was such a blast of a series to do um and fond memories of it and it was actually one of those games that i once i finished it a friend of mine at at the time really wanted it and i was like so scared that they were going to make expansions i didn't sell it but then he like gave me an offer i couldn't refuse so i was like sure and then i got my a copy again and i just want to own it it's that much fun power grid is Ooh, that's an oldie, 2004. That's 15 years old. Power Grid was a game I always stayed away from at the time. And it was like, because I always heard it was just mathy and grindy. And then I eventually, a friend of mine like bought it because he was, he played it at a gaming store. And he's like, oh, Seth will love this. So he got me a copy. And he was absolutely right. I think Power Grid is a really, really good game in terms of just... I mean, it's kind of it is kind of mathy, but it's really not that bad. Like, it's not like you're doing math the entire time. You just really have to just do basic addition and subtraction. Um, <clears throat> it's super balanced in terms of trying to, uh, you know, keep your keep your power plants up and running. You can go in a direction of wind energy, or you can go into just different types of, uh, you know, oil or or coal or uh, uranium. And things like that so just to power up as much as possible and then eventually it's like okay well first one who'd be able to power what 15 cities at once wins and this is a game i really want to buy the different maps for i've only ever played on the european map um but i know that the maps are drastically unique so i really need to get get a copy okay, so <clears throat> oh and real quick <sighs> should make some minions be in the top 100 man uh, probably not like I don't know though it was so fun and the the production was so good if it does I definitely don't think it needs to be at 35 like come on come on 35 really no this is where like earlier in the list you know 50s and up uh, yeah there was a lot of leeway Max versus minions like even though it's really good like I mean the gameplay is not mind-blowing I definitely think it should be maybe 70s or 80s but 35 no way power grid though I do think is kind of appropriately placed for being that old and still that good like it's it's definitely worthy and it's still getting some support so who made that game was it I think it was uh, freedom and freeze yep yep freedom and freeze so I was right all right 33 Th oh really Kingdom Death Monster, huh? At 33. So, actually, I'm going to change that to an 8. And that's appropriately placed as of right now. Earlier, whenever I we I did our first discussion for it, and I'm doing a series of Kingdom Death Monster right now. Uh, so you definitely, you know, I think we are in Lantern Year, Lantern Year 10. So... Uh, so I mean, we're 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 on our way. Uh, but whenever I, we did the first discussion, I gave it a ten out of ten, and then played, you know, way more games, and then it's dropped to a seven for me. But Kingdom Death Monster is a unique beast. It is kind of a hobby game because of just the sheer amount of miniatures and, uh, and just content that is for this game, and just the the different campaigns that you can play and how to play it. It's, I mean. The best way it's been described to me is it's Monster Hunter, the board game, and that's absolutely right. Like, you have your your heroes that you have to keep fighting monsters over and over and over, and just to get better gear to be able to, uh, you know, boost up your character with better, like I mentioned, better gear to go fight more monsters, and you just kind of power on through the, the base, you know, campaign of Lantern Year 30. And you have events and stuff like that, but it's a very dark, like, I love this world, and... Like, I I do love this game. I do I think it's a lot of fun, but it is very very stressful because the game is definitely not in your favor. It's very difficult, um, and I man fuck, I just you know back their stuff, their gambler's chest, and you know 
year year four or or wave four stuff on Black Friday, and I mean this game is insanely expensive, way overpriced, really for what it's worth, and I don't know how they're justifying that because like there's games that come out that have way better minis or just as good minis, and they're not that expensive. So he, you definitely understand like oh people will pay this much for this shit, but. I mean, because you also have to assemble the minis, which I actually find very therapeutic, and I do enjoy doing that. But, like, there are times where it's like, really? Really? Why do I have to put this stuff together? Uh, Kingdom Death Monster has a lot of stuff going for it. I don't think it needs to be 33. I, I do think it needs to be on the list. But what's super weird is that you have Power Grid, who has 51,000 voters, and Kingdom Death, who is above it, with 6,000. And I guarantee you there's 6,000 other people who spent so much money on it that they are convincing themselves that this is a 10 out of 10 game. And it's like, yeah, it's not, though. Now, I think it needs to be on the list because it is revolutionary and is a unique, one-of-a-kind game. But it doesn't need to be 33. Okay, Pandemic Legacy Season 2. Wow, okay. So, Season 2... I would I would say season one was way better. Uh, I wouldn't say way better. Season one was better than season two, but I did enjoy the season two. And I'm not going to go over any spoilers here. Um, I've done a series for Pandemic Legacy season two, and now this this is on here. Pandemic Iberia is on here, and Pandemic is on here. So out of all the Pandemic standalones, I think Iberia is the best, so sure. I think Pandemic by itself was revolutionary and is a solid cooperative game, so sure. But then there's Pandemic Legacy Season 2 that it's like, really? This is all the way up at 32? Don't get me wrong, the campaign was at least different from Season 1. And I, I enjoyed its differences uh, quite a bit. I'm very excited for Season 3. However... It's like, okay, I mean, it's still Pandemic Legacy, and it doesn't it didn't carry that same spark that Season 1 had, so it doesn't warrant being on 32 in, in the top 100 games of all time. I would say no, and at the same time, you have the same argument of this is a one-time play game. Like, when you buy it, you only get to play it that one time, or not the one time, but you, that campaign once, and then you would you throw the board away, like, or key or mount it, or do, it, do whatever you want, but you can't replay it. So you have that going against it. I mean, clearly I gave it a 9, and I very much enjoyed this campaign, and I've loved doing series for it, but it's, I mean, it's still Pandemic. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's just weird how it's at 32. Blood Rage. What am I doing? What am I doing there? There we go. I think I dropped it to a 9.5 initially because of its expansions. Um, I actually think their expansions are pretty bad for it and not needed. But Blood Rage by itself... Actually, that's not true. The Mystics expansion I do like, but the Gods of Asgard I don't like. Uh, but Blood Rage was such a hit when it came out in 2015, huh? Man, it always feels like that's only four years ago, but I... It, it, man... My life has changed quite a bit in just four years. That's insane. Because I remember where I was at when Blood Rage came out, and God, it is still so good. Uh, now, for me, like I said, I like Rising Sun more, but that's because I like negotiation and Feudal Japan. Blood Rage is such a solid, like, no, like there's no, I have no complaints about it at all. Like, love the card drafting, love the area control, love the drastic different, different strategies that you can play, and just the sheer amount of, of, you know, variety that just those three different cards give you is is so unique. I mean, I think last time I played this, I saw a strategy that I didn't even think was going to work. And it's just, I it's probably Simon's better game. Clearly, it's at 31. I do think it needs to be on the list. And I would, I would argue, even though I like Rising Sun better, objectively, Blood Rage is probably the better game because it's all strategy and you don't have to rely on negotiation. Like, in Rising Sun you can get away with a lot if you ally with someone and the game is is built for that but blood rage there's no allying you're just all it's all slaughter and mayhem and that's a lot of fun so i definitely think blood rage is is one of the best games that has ever been made so yeah this is this is definitely warranted this however is not now clearly i'm at a 9.5 on wingspan 
and I, I would stick by that. I think Wingspan is a really, really good game. And even though it's all about birds, like I love the Tableau engine building. Um, the European expansion I think is really good too. Changes the game slightly, but not too much. It adds more birds. Love the the production quality of this game, and I think it was a first time designer. She did an amazing job, and this is a really really good game. What well, my issue is, this does not need to be thirty since it came out this year. I should also mention at the time of this recording, it's December 17th, 2019. So, <clears throat> to have a game come out, I don't think there's been a single game up until this point that came out in this in, in, in this same year. I think Wingspan is the, is the first one. And I, I wholeheartedly disagree with this. I think Wingspan is amazing, but to be like, this is the best game of all time, it has not had developed enough time to be able to warrant if it's one of the greatest games. And I think at this point, it's the Stone... And I love Stonemaier games. Do not get me wrong. I'm sitting here saying at a 9.5, Wingspan is fantastic. I just don't think, just as a... I don't, I don't know, like, at a integral like listing to sit there and be like this is the best game of all like 30th best game of all time i don't think so at all so that's just uh, that's my opinion but i mean still wingspan is fantastic and play it but it i mean same people I mean, if tapestry is on this i will I, i'll i'll caca uh so actually that was the ending of that one i played a lot of games in this one so one two Three, four, f dang it! One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Hey, there we go. Eight out of those ten. Technically nine, but we'll get to that in a sec. Number twenty-nine is Mansions of Madness Second Edition. I can very much assure you, at least I should, the first edition is not on this list, and I really hope it's not. Mansions of Madness Second Edition is so good. Like, from second, it's it's amazing how different second edition is from first edition. But this is where kind of that app integration came in, and it is phenomenal. Like, basically revolutionized almost their gaming in general, and it's it's so good. This one is with just the different apps or not apps, <laughs> the different scenarios that the app takes with. It gives you more atmospheric music, sound effects. Uh, stories than even hell even DLC that they've been able to pump in there without you having to buy more. I mean, you have to buy the DLC for like five, five bucks for the scenario, but it's like oh, I don't have to buy spend forty for new stuff, and they're still releasing expansions. There's a lot of the content and a lot of stuff what they can do with that app. It basically like I, I'm pretty sure I set my first edition on fire. Um, like this game just does so wonders. It was one of the first games I played with one of my friends, and now he owns everything, and it's been a hit any time he tries. He plays it with other people. Um, I I would very much say Mansions of Madness needs to be on this list. Twenty nine. I mean, we're getting to a point that we're kind of splitting hairs. Like once again, I don't think Wingspan needs to be on here, but um, it's an objective list anyway for me because I'm one person versus the. 19,000 people that voted, but I definitely think it needs to be on the top 100. Uh, absolutely. So, Agricola. I talked about Agricola earlier. Um, because you have Agricola with the revised edition, and then you have just Agricola. Like, what the fuck? And I mentioned it before, I've never played Agricola, but Agricola in the Agricola revised edition does not need to be on the same fucking list. It's the same game. It's the same, like... Even the revised edition. Now, now, if it's a drastic difference, like Mansions of Madness Second Edition to First Edition, they're they are not the same game. I guess thematically they are, but in terms of game mechanics and and in concept, no, they're drastically different. But Agricola to the revised edition, whether they just include the expansion, and that's so dumb. I'm not saying Agricola is a bad game. I don't know. Like, it came out in 2007 and people highly regard it. I would very much say it probably deserves to be on this list, but both do not. That's so dumb. Food Chain Magnate is a game I have not played. It it looks so boring, but I know I would like it. I, I have a very good feeling that I would like this game. I just haven't got around to, you know, paying the money for it. So I probably will at some point just to, just to have it. Um... 
I know you just run your fast food chain, so I think I might like it. But it's also, there are games, same with Agricola, why I haven't played it, is my gaming group doesn't have an, have an interest in those types of themes. So, like, yeah, they'll play them with me, but then I'm like, well, will they play it again? Sure, they probably would, but it's like, I don't want to force them to play games that they really don't want to. Orleans. Um, I have played this game. I think I have accidentally created the deluxe version. Uh... Orleans is an app. It's almost an absolute masterpiece. Uh, this this game just uh, was actually sent to me <clears throat> by a guy. I don't even know if he watches my channel anymore, but he was like, "Hey, have you ever played Orleans?" And I was like, "No." And he sent me his copy to do a run through for, and I thought that was awesome. That was such a cool thing to do, um, and I'm glad he did because I never would have played this game otherwise. And this kind of this probably started, you know, kickstarting my my love for Euro games. So I uh, I love the the bag building aspect of this. The expansions for it are are top notch with the uh, trade and intrigue, or uh, I think that's what it's called. Then like the the one that adds the cooperative and the solo version. They're they're so good and uh. Like, it's, it's a solid, solid streamlined game that I, I remember showing it to a friend of mine, and it last year, it was his number one game of all time, so that's that's such a, uh, I mean, if that doesn't say how great this game is, it's like, it's it's definitely a must that you have to play, and definitely worth being on the top 100. Caverna! Never played, I have never played Caverna, uh, and I don't know, I think they... What was it cave by cave or something where it was like a two player caverna? I really need to try this out. I need to try Agricola and Caverna out just to get my own opinion on them to see which one's better and then sell the other, like if I don't like it. But I, I really need to just to say I did. Um, I feel like they would be thematically, you know, pleasing games, but I just haven't. A Feast for Odin. This is a game that I have had for a little bit. I remember I owned the base game, and then I went to a game store, and I saw the expansion, the Norwegian Norwegian expansion. I was like, oh, I, I know this is hard to get, so I just bought it. So I, ha I own them both, and I know I'm going to like them because... Ah, my neck. Because <laughs> Uwe Rosenberg games I do enjoy, uh, at least the one I have played, Indian Summer... Um, this one is just kind of intimidating, not to me so much, but to my friends, whenever you know that there's like 50 different work replacement spots, that it's like, hey, you want to play a Feast for Odin and learn 50 different spots? Well, at the time, no, they don't. I just need to set it up and be like, okay, this is what we're doing, because I'm sure we would all like it. Mage Knight, 6.8, that's such a dumb rating. Um, so Mage Knight... Man, that is so weird that it's at 23. Why is this at 23? That is crazy. So Mage Knight, I mean, it has good aspects of a game. It's essentially a deck builder uh, that you use dice that are the man in the air to be able to play a combination. I, I actually really like the card play is that you can use mana to upgrade the, the spell you're playing to boost it to its second level. Use your spells to be able to move around the board to battle. Um... It was kind of a gamer's game. Every like monster had a bunch of little stats on it, uh, and the game was scenario based. I feel like this game might be really solid solo, but it's also been years since I've played it. It came out in twenty eleven, huh? Yeah, so I don't quite know if if I would like it. I saw the deluxe box not too long ago, and I and I thought about picking it up because. I might really like this game now, but at the time I didn't really care for it. So this 6.5 is a reflection of when I played it five years ago. Um, so, but at 23, huh? That is that is so that's crazy. That is crazy. I wonder why it's at 23. I mean, it, it must be. I would I would argue it's a solo community playing it. 22 is Puerto Rico. Never played, never played Puerto Rico. It's funny, all these older, older games and older, I mean, this one's 17 years old. Um, like, they're, they're ones that I, that people, especially like me, who were playing games around that time are like, no, you have to try it. And it's like, do I? Do I though? Like, 
I mean, what what makes Puerto Rico so special? I don't know. Like, I'm not opposed to it. It's not like I'm one of those guys that's like, no, I only play the newest games. It's like, hey, I played Old Grande whenever it was, I mean, still like 30 years old. So, and I and I really liked it. So, I'm not opposed to trying it. I just probably won't go out of my way to try it. So, I don't know. At 22, could be, could be accurate. And then 21 is Arkham Horror the card game. This game is so good. Like and I love that they keep releasing expansion. This is one of, this is a, a a deck building game that I absolutely love. Um it, it it I mean it helps that it's Arkham Horror. I think this game does such a really good job at making scenarios feel thematic within within a card game. You don't need a board and 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 events to make that happen. You have the cards that do it all for you. Um, they do a lot of really neat, innovative ways that with the locations of the cards. I love the um, the vast variety of you of with each each you know investigator and, and the way you can build their deck around you know their special abilities and uh, all the different campaigns that they have. It's this is a really good one. I definitely would say it deserves to be in the top one hundred. So that is it for that segment. I have played that. I didn't even know this was in the top 100. That is insane to me. So, I have played one, two, three, four, five. I have played five in that segment. Okay, so only two segments left. What is happening to my pen? Two segments left. Let's get through this. Number 20 is Viticulture, the Essential Edition. If I had to guess, Viticulture, the non-essential essential edition is on this list. Um, so, Stonemaier Games, like, they do a fantastic job. They're one of those companies that you're most likely to get your bang for your buck. Um, and Viticulture, I think, is really good. I know a lot of people knock it because they feel like it's too random. I view it as it's one of those games that whatever you're dealt, do the best with what you got. Um... And because like, and a lot of it is like the the people that you can you know draw from the cards. It's like really you got that one. It's like look, you can get one that's really good for you too. It's like just do the best with what you got. Most of the those cards aren't game breaking, um, but I really really like this. This is like one of those pure kind of themes where you're just running a vineyard and you're trying to you know you know plant grapes uh, to be able to pull in and then make wine and then age that wine into and combine it into, uh, you know, certain wines that you're trying to sell to make money and get points for it. Uh, and then you have the, you know, the Essential Edition that adds the expansions, so the Tuscany stuff that adds, like, the new season and stuff like that. And I, I think Viticulture is a really, really, really good game. And Stonemaier has really sprouted as one of those companies that you just, you gotta love them. Like, I... They've almost they've almost never steered me wrong in any of their games. So I think Viticulture is definitely a game that needs to be in the top 100. At 20 though, couldn't tell you. Brass Lancashire. Now I feel like they've just released a bunch of brass games. I have never played any brass games, so I I have no idea with that one. Concordia, man. Concordia is a game that I have been told to play multiple times that I would love it and I really do need to play it. Like I'm sure that I would like it. I I mean I the only thing I know about it is that the box art is ugly, but I haven't had a chance to to get around to play it, so I don't know unfortunately. Ugh gross. <laughs> Seven Wonders Duel. I do not I think so I don't really care for Seven Wonders Duel, which is weird because you would think I would because I like Seven Wonders so much. But I don't understand how Seven Wonders can be, where is it, Seven, Seven Wonders can be 49 and Seven Wonders Duel can be freaking 17. Like, that is insane to me. I mean, I, I wholeheartedly believe Seven Wonders is way better than Seven Wonders Duel. And granted, it like I understand that the Pantheon expansion makes Seven Wonders Duel better. I don't care. I don't think an expansion should fix the game. And that's this once again, this is just my opinion. But I guarantee that it has to do with the fact that it is for two people. Like smaller market, easier game to play, 
that it it just appeals to more people. But at 17, like come on, being able to add it that high as one of the 17th best game of all time over Seven Wonders that was one here longer. And two at like 49? Come on, that's so dumb. But even then, even if people like Seven Wonders do a better, it's, it's just, I mean, well, it's not the same game. Like, in concept, it's the same game, but it does play differently. But, man, no, Seven Wonders is way better. The Seventh Continent. At 16, I actually thought this one was higher. So the Seventh Continent was one of those Kickstarter games that is absolutely innovative. It's a survival game where you just have like 5,000 amounts of cards that you, the cards are your board and you lay them out and you're discovering new cards. And if you look at like the, the card, you're like, oh, this has a 14 on it or something. And you look for the card and you find 14 and you replace it, which adds a new exploration thing. Um, the, I mean, the, the theme is that you're, you know, an, an investigator going back to the seventh continent to, to solve a curse, and I have everything for it. So this game was so unique and innovative that I I absolutely love it. I mean, I gave it a ten out of ten, and I still stand by that. Like, just the unique innovation of the of the way you get successes. You don't roll dice. You can combine equipment if you have certain equipment for certain things, and that gets you to a completely different card that you otherwise wouldn't have gotten to. Um, so many different uh, uh, curses that take you through different, you know, world. Now, I guess not really worlds, but different experiences within the story. Um, the decisions that you make, the way the world evolves as as things progress. It's just this game just fires on all cylinders for me. And I feel like the only downside is that it's. I mean, I would say it's not that good as a multiplayer game I would say two at max just because the game is so free-flowing there's no turns really you you have something you do on your turn but there's no okay I did something you do something you now you can do that but it's uh, I mean I would say this game is best played solo or two at max other than that I think it's fantastic um, at 16 I'm, I'm surprised it's actually not higher I, I thought I really thought it was Castles of Burgundy. Never played. I haven't played the. Uh, what was it? The card. There's either either a card game or a dice game. I can't remember which, but yeah, I I haven't played it, so I don't know. I've I've heard it's really good though. Who made this? Was this uh, was this um Steffenfeld? Actually, funny enough, I don't think I've played a single Steffenfeld game. <gasps> nope. Nope, never played a Steffenfeld game. I know Rado praises. I think that's his favorite favorite designer, and he's done a top ten Steffenfeld games. I think he's played every single one of them. I haven't played a single one of them. That's funny. Ooh, Spirit Island. Damn, that's a good one. That is a really good one. That is my favorite cooperative game, and and the reason why one because the theme is really cool. Two, the spirits are one like radically unique. Um, now, production quality of this game is kind of piss poor, and the artwork of the board is actually not that great. But the artwork on the the powers and the 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 spirits are really cool. Um, this game requires so much cooperation uh, that it's it's fantastic. Like that's what makes it my favorite game because you have two types of powers: you have fast powers and slow powers, and you have spirits that are. Uh, you know, support, you have spirits that are aggressive, big on fear, big on land development, big, big on control, um, faster, slower spirits. So it's like, okay, I can do this power, and it's fast. Okay, what can you do? Oh, okay, well, you can do a slow power, but I have a power that can make that slow power fast, and you can just do so much trying to, uh, you're playing role reversal, essentially. You're not the conquerors trying to conquer that and fight off the spirits. You're the spirits fighting off the invaders. And the game can actually get really thematically dark. Like, I remember one time we had a power that, like, caused, like, the the fear level to go up. And, like, it, it, you, you basically moved the, the invaders to another spot. And so I moved them through fear. And then the, the river spirit, like, drowned them and killed them. And it's like... That's kind of fucked up if you really think about it, because these are people that are just trying to colonize it, and it's like, hey, no, this is our, this is our island. It's, 
it's so awesome thematically like the, the spirits are just so cool it, it's it's really really good um the only reason it's not a 10 out of 10 for me is that the game and the i mean the rule book is not terrible it's just kind of convoluted and it makes it a little bit difficult to teach otherwise the game itself is just i mean so good and really really hard like it's very hard to to win this game Number 13 is Terra Mystica. I have never played Terra Mystica, and there's another game that came out, that Gaia, Gaia Project, that was like a Terra, Terra Mystica kind of game. Um, I have not played either, and I really want to try Gaia Project. Uh, Terra Mystica, I've heard, is just kind of themeless, but I, I mean, it's it's all I want to play. Like, I do really want to play this. And I want to play Gaia Project, too. I just haven't got around to it. Ooh, that makes me happy. Number 12 is War of the Ring. That is, you, you know how Star Wars Rebellion is like Star Wars in a box? War of the Ring is Lord of the Rings in a box, and I think Lord of the Rings is vastly superior than Star Wars. Um, just Lord of the Rings, not The Hobbit, um, but this is such a such a good two-player game. One person plays, you know, the Shadow Army, the other person plays the Free People, um, where the free people, you know, have limited resources. Shadow Army has unlimited, uh, but it's such a balanced, good game that the free people. There's actually both sides have two ways to win. One on both sides is to you know conquer certain strongholds. I think the shadow has to get ten points of strongholds, and the free peoples have to get four, uh, four points, and then. Uh, the other way the Shadow People can win is if they corrupt the Fellowship, or essentially Frodo, or, and the Free Peoples win if they can get Frodo through Mount Doom, uh, to Mount Doom, and then toss the ring into, into Mount Doom. And this game is so thematic, but it also begs the question of, like, what if? And with the expansions, Lords of Middle-Earth and the Warriors of Middle-Earth, um, they just add in all those extra characters. Warriors of Middle-Earth was their latest one that basically added more factions for the free people and more factions for the shadow people it just made the game that much more enriching and every time i even think about lord of the rings or think about playing this i immediately want to watch the movies or play the game and love it love it do i think it needs to be in top 100 absolutely like it's i mean i i actually don't like battle uh battle of the five armies and I, at this point, I really don't think it's going to be on, on this list unless it's in the top 10 for some weird reason. But I think this game is vastly superior. A lot of people don't like the war track, which is fine, but I, 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 can, I can see why they don't. Because not everyone on the Free Peoples is what they want to fight, which is thematically appropriate. But you can, you can have people break off from the Fellowship. You can have Legolas go talk to the elves and be like, hey... You want to fight, and then he can get them ready and then move down to the, the war, so then you can start corralling the people. Same with all that. Each member of the Fellowship has their own unique abilities if they're leaders of the Fellowship or if they're by themselves. It's just, this game is so good. I, I absolutely love it. So, and, ooh, Great Western Trail. This was a game that I picked up kind of on a whim. I had heard it was good, and then whenever I played it, I was just blown away by how how awesome and streamlined this game is. You're, you're I mean, you're essentially herding cattle, and just the the multitude of ways to get points in this. The the different you know the train track and the you know how how far you're you're sending the cattle, how what kind of cattle you're bringing in, what stations you're building. Um, as people are just kind of going through it, it, it feels like you're going through the motions, but you're really not. I mean, you're you're moving your your cowboy like up a track, but there's different ways to do it, and then you can get multiple points for doing certain things. This game is so so good. Um, I remember one time I played though, like. The, the the path that I took was a path that a friend didn't, and by the time we got to final scoring, I just, like, got done tallying, and then I was just like, all right, so what do you think? Because it was, like, 90 to 20. It was such a radically, like, I mean, it was an outlier game. Um, it was one that I immediately went out and got the expansion for, because this game is just, uh, it's so good. And his other one, what was it, Blackout? Uh, I have not played Blackout, but it's from the same same designer of of them. What's his name? Alexander Fister. Like this game is so good that I've wanted to try Blackout, and I really need to. But 
Um, but yeah, so that's it for that segment. Do oh do I need do I think this needs to be in the top one hundred? Uh, I think it's really really good. Yeah, probably for a western. I think so. Now at eleven, and man, that's 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 a tougher call. Like, do I think Great Western Trail is better than all the other ninety games? I personally don't, but I guess other people thought so. I mean, it's solid. Like, I really don't have any complaints for it that I can think of right now. But, let's see. So, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six for that, for that segment. Um, and then last but not least, the top ten of Board Game Geek. Number ten, Scythe. I think that should be higher. <laughs> I definitely think Scythe should be at least top five. I'm curious to see where they've put them. But uh, as you can see, Scythe is a 10 out of 10 for me. Uh, last year, it was my it was my top, you know, my number one game of all time. And uh, it's had three expansions. One was a faction expansion. I feel like that could have been in the base game. But I do, like, I have no complaints with Scythe at, at all. Um... And then the Invaders, or that was the Invaders from afar, the Wind Gambit was such an improvement and an expansion that needed uh, to be in Scythe. Just quick and, you know, speed of the pace, add, add, you know, the flying ships that help you carry people or resources that will drastically increase the game and player interaction. And then the Rise of Fenris expansion, which added a campaign, and uh, I'm not going to, you know, ruin anything for that, but... Um, just they, it's just all fantastic and a game that has just gorgeous artwork, um, streamlined, solid gameplay. Like I got, I got nothing. I mean, I, it makes me happy. It's in the top ten games of all time. I, I definitely think it needs to be higher though, and definitely, obviously, deserves to be in the top one hundred. I think by far this is Stone Meyer's best game, and, uh, and it, I think, I think everyone seems to agree with that one. So. There's Gaia Project. Okay, I wasn't sure if that was on the list or not. Uh, like I said, I haven't played. I mean, Terra Mystica is at 13. So, and what's funny is that a lot of these are kind of like none of these are really Ameritrash games. So, I uh, I mean that just kind of shows that most people enjoy strategic thinking. Um, still with theme though. Uh, which we're seeing a lot more of. Like it's no longer just oh, okay, take dirt from here to here alright you get 10 points like none of that we're starting to see really solid you know gameplay mechanisms and theme uh, being integ integrated Gaia Project like I said I've never played uh, it's definitely on my list but god it's so expensive um, so hey on Amazon it's 77 bucks that's not too bad see that's the thing though is like market price it's a hundred like it's difficult I want I and I do try to support uh, my my well, I don't really have a local game store where I live, but uh, one that's relatively close. I try to support them as much as possible. It's just hard to go out there and pay the extra twenty bucks, you know. But it is what it is. Uh, so I've never played Gaia Project. <sighs> no, no, no. <laughs> so Star Wars Rebellion. Um, like I mentioned, if you. Uh, if you really like Star Wars, Star Wars Rebellion is Star Wars in a box. Uh, my biggest complaint with Star Wars Rebellion was that, and I played it quite a bit whenever it came out, so maybe I would like it again, but at the time, I was like so burnt out, and like, like I do like it, like the Empire has to find the the base, and then that's exciting, and then you have to strategically try and complete missions and send people on missions and things like that as the as the rebellion to to complete it, and then um, like over time, like if the if the Empire cannot find you or cannot take over your base, then the the rebels will win, and I would argue that it, the game is in favor of the rebels more so than the the Empire. Um, so it was a little unbalanced in that aspect. Um, but other than that, like, I, I personally think that, if anything, these two need to be switched, the War of the Ring and Star Wars Rebellion, but that's because I like Lord of the Rings way more than Star Wars. Clearly, I'm probably the outlier in that. Uh, but, I mean, Star Wars Rebellion definitely was kind of revolutionary at its time, and they released the expansion, 
oh, what was it? What was that expansion called? I can't remember what the expansion was called, but I do remember that it definitely streamlined the combat. It made the combat way better. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I, I really have no inkling of, of playing Star Wars Rebellion again. I don't really. Should it be in the top 100? I would say yes, because it's a, I mean, it is a really good Star Wars two-player game. If you want to know movies 4, 5, and 6 and kind of be in that world, that's the game that you want to that you want to play. But I don't think it's number 8. Like, that's, that's, that's a really high. There it is. There it is. This I agree with. Twilight Imperium 4th Edition, I agree with. Wherever the hell 3rd Edition was, I don't remember. It was, it was in here, though. Um, anyway, I, I, like, Twilight Imperium 4th Edition is, like I mentioned earlier, Basically, third edition, but streamlined and quicker. And basically, the biggest difference is that technology track. In third edition, you had, uh, and I've done a no run through review for for uh, fourth edition, but in uh, third edition, you had an actual tree. Like you needed this specific tech and this one to get this one, and so on and so forth. And it was so convoluted and confusing to new players, and hell, even kind of like regular players that it was just kind of annoying to go a tech route. In 4th edition, now it's just color-coded. It's like, oh, to get this, I need a red and a yellow. Great. I can get that. And then, I mean, they kept the uh, the factions. The factions are still unique. The gameplay, I mean, hell, uh, even better thematic improvements that now there's no longer a politics track just because someone picks a politics track. Like, you go over laws and, and rule changes from that. If someone controls Me uh, Mechatol Rex, which is the main city, that make like, thematically, based on the Twilight Imperium world, that makes sense. That's like your your government planet. So it's, it makes sense that they're going to be doing laws if someone's there controlling it, not just randomly. So, and you still vote based off, you know, your influence and all that, and I think that's great. Uh, the game is essentially the exact same, but better. And, I mean, I definitely think it needs to be, you know, I think 7 is actually appropriate. Where my problem is, is they still have 3rd edition in, in this list, and it doesn't need to be. Like, I don't, so that's why I'm pretty sure that all of this is just fucking, you know, I guess based off of people's, like, votes and, or, like, rankings. And so there's 9,000 people that probably rated an 8 or higher, so then it becomes... I don't know. I don't know how this is comprised, but I wish Board Game Week would kind of streamline this a little bit better so that you don't have a revised edition of Agricola and Agricola. You don't have through uh, Twilight Imperium, 4th edition, and 3rd edition. It's just stupid. Like, you can have other games in this that aren't the same game. Number six, Twilight Struggle. So this one's interesting because this game was number one for so long. And now there's five games that people deem to be appropriate or, or better than it. And Twilight Struggle is a solid fucking game. Like, basically, the Cold War. One person plays the USA, the other person plays the USSR. And there's just that absolute sense of, you know, a tug of war of trying to control certain areas, use cards to benefit yourself, but also if you use them to benefit yourself, you're benefiting the other player. There's no first person to 20 points. I mean, there is that, that's how you win, but there's no two tracks. You compete with points, so if I gain 10 points, or if I gain 5 points, and then the other person gains 10 points, they only move up to 5 instead of 10, so that's an interesting struggle of, of uh, tactics. You have the space race that give you benefits, if you get up and you start doing well on that, you also have the sense of maybe a nuclear apocalypse uh, or, or a nuclear warfare. This game is really, really good. And uh, unfortunately, it's a game that is difficult to get to the table because it is, it's, I mean, it, it's kind of a beast to learn. Um, but man, one of the best kind of war games that, that I've ever played, I guess it's a war game. I mean, it's called the Cold War. But, uh, and coming out in 2005, though, and being at number six, hell, I think it was like, it was three years ago, it was, it was usurped. So, I mean, it was, it was number one for, for a very long time, and I would say that it, it makes sense that being number one. Now at number six, who knows? Huh. Brass Birmingham. Okay, so they did release a brass game. 
re recently. I've never played it. I don't really know anything about it. I know they had the Brass Land, Land, Lancaster, Land, Lancashire, whatever it was. Uh, I don't know how drastically different those games are. If they're basically the same, I, I don't know. But for a game to come out in 2018 and be number five, that's, uh, that's, that's, I guess that's pretty special. But I don't know. I don't think, I see, here's the thing. It's like this game came out in 2005, and that's proved for over 14 years that it's been solid. Uh, like, look at this. Like, 2016, 2017, 2016, 2017. This is the fourth edition. So, I mean, like I said, it's basically the same game. My problem is not that that this is at seven. My problem is that third edition is still on the list. But it's like really, I don't know. I don't know. A lot of these games, like like I said, are very, very good and are highly appraised. It's just weird how they're so high. Here it is. So number four is Through the Ages, A New Story of Civilization. And they have at number whatever. Um, where is it? Where is it? I remember it being right there. 36. It's the same game, except now this one is... is uh, it's just it's just a cleaner streamlined game, but they're the same fucking game. So this is fine. Like Through the Ages is one of those games that eight point nine. Like what is like what what's the point one? Why is that so different? Um, I don't know why I rated games like that. So you might I gave it a nine and I previously owned it, but this game was one of those games that it's like it was so good. This is gonna be so weird. It's so good and so much like a civilization game that I'd rather play Civilization on my PC. So it just this game took so long to sit around the table to complete that. It's like, okay, I'd rather play it on PC and then be able to break it up and save it. Um, now they're about to release an expansion for it, which I was very surprised, but this game is very, very solid. And it's actually one of the games that I regret selling. I'm actually gonna pick it up again because it, it is really, really good. Um, like if you like civilization games, this is the the best one on the market, uh, without a doubt. And I mean, because you do go through those peaks, and you do have that that sense of like this is the civilization that I want to build. The, the government change, the leaders that you want to recruit that are going to give you powers. Whether you want a war with someone or peace, uh, make peace with someone, um, is and you want to you want to advance in a, in a certain way. This is the game for you and. I mean, I still give it a nine, even though I sold it. it. Like, it's just, it's that good. And I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pick it back up. It's actually in my cart. So now, what makes me mad is that it's not that this is at four. It's that the other one is still on the list. Like, I don't, I, I mean, I know I've said it multiple times, but that's what makes this list so stupid. Is that most people, if they want to look at this, they're like well that's the same game and I know it's just a list and it's clearly subjective but it's like if people want to look at it and be like hey I want to own the top 100 games well I mean really it's like the top 90 games 95 games uh, that they're, they could be missing out I don't know number three is terraforming Mars this game is an absolute banger like whenever this came out it just took the world by storm like these this is people's favorite games of like all time terraform mars is amazing the prelude expansion is phenomenal i actually just did a solo run through for terraforming mars so you can go check that out and my thoughts on the expansions for it um this is an awesome engine building game uh multiple ways to to score points and play the way that you want to play and I mean, really, like, actually, let's go ahead and give this a 9, because the expansions for it do uplift it. Some, like, I think aren't really necessary, but others I think are really good, that I think the overall, like, experience of, of them is, is a positive, so it goes up a point for that. And fantastic solo, so that has a lot going for it, um, and still really, really good with other players. Like, just the, it, it's as, it's probably the best, Mars game out there in terms of like you know kind of theme and the scientific research that we're, that's done behind it. I can definitely see why it's at number three. Definitely deserves to be on the top one hundred. Number two is Pandemic Legacy Season One. This was the game that usurped Twilight Struggle and has since now three three games before the, uh, since then have you know come up close behind it. 
um, pushing Twilight Struggle down to six. This was actually, uh, like, this generated a lot of buzz because Pandemic Legacy was so unique that when it came out, it was like, what? A Legacy game? And there was Risk Legacy, and I think maybe a few others had tried, but this one was like, okay, we know Pandemic's a good game, now let's make a campaign story about it where you destroy cards, ride on it, and it took the world by storm. Everyone was making a Legacy game after this, and no one could quite capture that lightning in a bottle, but they did, and... Like, I did a full series of this one, and while it was exhausting half the time, like, the two people that did it with me, like, I still got to give them props, because they stuck it out, they did it with me, even though I could tell that they really didn't want to halfway through, but they did it, and um, I was greatly appreciative of that. One of my favorite ending skits, like, definitely go, if you, if anything... If you don't watch the series, go watch the ending skit because it's it's my favorite one that I've ever done. Um, and this experience was one of a kind. Like it was like a, an emotional roller coaster, like stressful, like impactful. Storytelling was really good. Spawned a really good season two, but season one is way better than season two. I, like I said, not way better, but it is better than season two. Um, I am excited for season three. But what's weird is that this is people are considering this the second best game of all time, and I don't agree at all. I think this is a really really good game. But one, you play the campaign once. Um, I know Rado says that you can play, you know, play the you know with your own board. I don't agree with that in any way, shape, and form. But sure, to each their own. I. Uh, and, I mean, you can play the campaign over and over again, but you're not going to have that, you know, same same feeling. You're going to know what's coming, because it's not choice-based. So you have that. Then it's still Pandemic with just a twist. Like, yeah, I mean, there are drastic changes to the game, and uh, the choices you make do stay. But it's like, why is this number two? Like, this should be around the same one as season Season 2, same area, like 30s, 40s, sure. But I think just the fact that it was kind of the first of its kind to be amazing. And then it's just stuck. But, I, I mean, if anything, because these things don't, like, move up and down like my top 100 does uh, or anyone else's top 100. They're kind of static. So even as games come in, like Legacy Season 1 is going to stay. It's just going to slowly move. I don't know. Like... Because I don't see Twilight Struggle coming up above Brass or something. I mean, it might. I don't. I don't know. But I definitely don't think this needs to be number two on the list for sure. Like I would say this one in season two. I don't think season two should be on the list. Like I think season one should be on the list. But that's that's just me. And finally, number one game on Board Game Geek is Gloomhaven. Now. Gloomhaven is kind of in a similar boat as Pandemic Legacy Season 1 and 2, is that it's an experience based around a really good gameplay. Um, so now I have it as a 10 out of 10, and I still stick by that. And I have I'm doing a series of Gloomhaven right now, still ongoing, so you can definitely check, uh, you know, check that out and keep up with you know my story and my decisions. But yeah, I mean, Gloomhaven is is a fantastic game. And here's the thing. I don't know what game should be number one. Like, clearly I have my own personal taste, but... And 30,000 people have voted that Gloomhaven is, I mean, at, at least like a 9 or 10 for them. And this game became the higher... I think I think a lot... Influences a lot. Like, like Rado, I think this jumped to his, top, his favorite game of all time. Tom Vassell was... The, it was... You know, his number one game, it, I mean, Cosmic Encounter. Oh, shit. I just realized Cosmic Encounter is not in the top 100. That's interesting. Huh. Anyway, like, his was, Cosmic Encounter was his number one for a long time. Then Gloomhaven came out, then that beat it, and it was like a cult of the new kind of thing. And I think that's what influenced a lot of people. And the other thing about the, the whole rating system of Board Game Geek is just absurd because people will vote it a 10 just for hype. The games, like, games aren't even fucking out yet, so I guarantee you that plays a number into this, that the number of voters are people who voted for it before it even came out. And, I mean, they didn't go in and delete it, so it's just, it's, this is all just kind of skewed data, but this was a huge thing when it came out. It's been number one for the past two years. Um, 
I had a problem with it because it became number one and it was a brand new game. And I'm like, how? How is that the best game of all time? And it came out at number one. Or it and it's number one and came out this year. Like, it's just absurd to me. I kind of basically just wanted to go through this whole list just to kind of just talk about, you know, a hundred different games and uh basically do a quick spin on my thoughts. I've actually done a run through for quite a bit, like uh, or at least a no run through review for it. I mean, Gloomhaven's a series. Pandemic Legacy was a series. Terraforming Mars just went up through the ages. I I did a run through. I did a playthrough for um, Twilight Imperium was a no run through review. Rebellion's a run through. That's an old one though. Scythe it was a no run through review and a run through. Like I've actually done quite a bit of run throughs for the top one hundred. Um, but I mean, like I said, Gloomhaven absolutely without a doubt needs to be in the top one hundred games of all time. And number one. I mean, even though it came number one in 2017, it's still holding strong at number one. At this point, I would say, sure. Like, it's, the gameplay I think is phenomenal. Like, the, it's, a, it's a Euro dungeon crawler. Like, there are some weird things about it. Nothing that's like a, a huge negative for me, but not even really like a minor. They're just weird. Just things that you have to, like how certain items that you, you exhaust or others you consume. But it's like, but it's an axe. Like, did I just, like, break it? And I'm like, all right, don't need that anymore. But I'll get it back next. It's just so weird things like that. But the hand management, the deck building, the, the unique world, the choices, uh, like, everything fires on all cylinders for me with this game. Um, now, there are games that are coming out that I think, like, in 2019, that I think should definitely be on this list. Absolutely. But uh, none of them are. Um... But other than that, let's see, in the top 10, I had 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I had eight, uh, 8 games that that were in that segment. So let's see, uh, out of all... Okay, so out of all the games in the top 100, I have played 61 of them. And so, I mean, clearly that is 39 games out of the top 100 that I have not played. So take what I, you know, say with a grain of salt, 39 games, those might be ones that are definitely worth playing. And, um, like, with that being said, if there are any of those 39 that you are, like, you have to play this game, um... Then definitely let me know in the comments below. Like, and and if any of the thirty nine, or hell, even the ones that I haven't done the run throughs for, let me know what games you want to see run throughs for and discussions, because I definitely have a lot more to say than the quick snippet I I did for each of the games I have played. So uh, definitely let me know those in the comments below. Real quick, I mean, I have a no or need to run through geek list that uh, I try to keep this as up to date. You can go on my board game geek and and check this out. Uh, and it shows all the games that I own um, that I haven't done run-throughs for. So you can check that on Make Recommendations. Any recommendations that are done get put on, like, a basically as, as the, okay, like the, I need to do this. Um, so you can definitely go check that out. Uh, but other than that, I, I hope you enjoyed my thoughts on the Board Game Geeks Top 100 games of all time. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you. Hey everyone, thank you for watching, and I really hope that you enjoyed the video. If you would like to see more of my content, go ahead and click that subscribe button and the bell to be notified whenever I upload any new content. If you feel like supporting the channel, you can go ahead and click that Patreon link to be taken to my Patreon, and any help is truly appreciated. Other than that, stick around for any, any other run-throughs or reviews or cool top tens or whatever I feel like putting on. Other than that, like, comment, share, and subscribe, and have a wonderful whatever time of day it is for you.